some years ago now, when David Lohman was Archduke in the South End, he asked me a question. If you could take only one book from the Bible on a desert island, which one would it be? So from the 66 books that make up the Bible, would it be from the New Testament or the Old Testament? Would it be historical, prophetic, poetry, gospel, letter, or whatever? Now possibly many people would choose either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. For it would be good on that lonely desert island to refresh one's mind concerning all that Jesus came to do, all he said, all that happened to him. And if I was to choose one of them, I suppose I would choose the Gospel according to Luke. I like the breadth. It begins before the birth of Christ and goes right the way through to the Ascension. But others, I guess, would choose the Psalms, the songbook of the Jewish Church. So whatever your mood, whatever your situation, whether you were sad, happy, struggling with life or rejoicing, you can usually find a song to fit the situation. Well, when the archdeacon asked me, I thought he was winding me up, a bit of a joke. But I looked at him and saw that he wasn't. He was serious. So I thought, I'd better give some thought to this. And what I did in the end was to choose, I went to the New Testament and chose one of Paul's letters. So let me explain why I would choose this one. Remember, I'm on a desert island on my own. And no doubt, I will be thinking back, back at home, where my family, friends, those most dear to me, would be. I'd be missing them. Well, we begin reading Paul's letter to the Philippians. And the burden there, in these opening verses, is that Paul is grateful to all those at Philippi for all they meant to him, mean to him, all they did with him, and all they did for him. And he promises to continue to pray for them. And really, that's what I should be doing, wouldn't we? I'll be praying for the family and friends back home. But, when Paul's friends learn of his situation, for he was in prison, no doubt they were very sad for him and for the sake of the gospel, because Paul, a great evangelist, was used to going from place to place proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And now, he was in prison. Disaster. And Paul says, not so. For my being in prison has meant that those who would not normally hear the gospel, namely the guards that are looking after me, are hearing the gospel. I may be in change, but it doesn't stop me talking about Jesus. So these verses from chapter 1 would be a reminder to me, lonely on that desert island, that God is at work. You know, at the moment, I can't see what his plan and purpose is. Then comes those challenging words to verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is going. Paul longed to go to be with Christ for eternity. Yet he felt there was still so much more to do on earth. A reminder to me of the eternal perspective of my daily life. Wherever I am, must be lived in the light of the fact that he has prepared a heavenly home for me, for you. <coughs> Chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, would help me not to feel sorry for myself. For this early Christian hymn reminds us that Christ came down to heaven, from heaven, to be one of us, to live as one of us, and to die so that we might be forgiven and go to be with him in heaven. And so my suffering, indeed all our suffering, has to be seen in the light of his suffering for us. 
Chapter 3 reminds us of how we get right with our holy God. Not by being good, not by coming to church, not by being baptised or confirmed, though all these things are good and important. Simply, simply by accepting in faith what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And the challenge at the end of the chapter is to keep going. I am saved through faith in Jesus Christ. But I've got to keep going as a follower of Jesus Christ, day by day by day. And Paul used the picture of the athlete. The athlete has got to keep running until he breaths the tape and the race is over. And you and I, in the race of life, so to speak, have to keep living out our relationship to Jesus day by day and all we say and do. We've got to keep going. Sadly, sadly, Christians don't always agree, do they? How do you get on with those around you? We don't always agree. And chapter 4 opens up with Paul encouraging two women who haven't got along together to sort it out. And on that desert island, it will be a reminder for me to pray for you all back home. That you would get on well with another. And it would also be important to fill my mind, as Paul says, with whatever is true, honourable, just, pure, lovely and gracious. For so easy, we bow, we can pray, we think of the if only this, if only this had happened, if only that had happened. And this passage would help me in that. And now as he draws to a close, Paul says how grateful he was that the people at Philippi had helped him. Although, he says, I am content, whatever the situation, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And what a challenge. Would I, would you, be content on a desert island? Are you content with your life as it is at the moment? The keynote of this book of Philippians is the word joy. It occurs many times in these chapters. Remember, this is from a man who is in prison, who can't get out on the open road again to tell people about Jesus. So, one book from the Bible? I think I'd probably choose Philippians. And so I was very pleased to know that the New Testament reading for today was from that very book. Only a few verses. And no doubt it's been chosen because of that phrase, the Lord is at hand, or the Lord is near, or the Lord is coming soon, whatever the translation you go for. A reminder to, during this season of Advent that the Christ who came once at Christmas is coming again. Well, there are some 300 references to the return of Christ in the New Testament. And when he comes, he comes this time as Lord and Judge, whether people like it or not. Well, from our reading from Philippians, what I've done is choose four words. They seem appropriate for Christmas, but they seem also appropriate for us as we await the return of Christ. The first one is the obvious one, rejoice. And Paul writes in our reading, rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. We rejoice at Christmas because he's become one of us. Marvellous time. Second word from the New Testament uh, from the reading is thanksgiving. For as we wait, await his return, we have so much to be grateful for. Historically, because the coming of Jesus into this world is a pivotal moment in the history of our world. But personally, for all we give thanks for all that he can mean to us. Emmanuel, God with us, day by day. Saviour, for he died to make it possible for you and me to be forgiven. Lord, for he defeated death and has opened up the door of heaven to all who believe in him. Friend, for each and every one of us is special to Jesus and died. 
For life is not always easy, but with him, with help, we can move forward, trusting him each step of the way. Rejoice, thanksgiving. The third word is moderation. Let your moderation be known unto all men. That's how the old prayer book used to put it. In fact, that Greek word is very, very difficult to translate. And other translations suggest gentleness, graciousness, forbearance. It's the opposite of abrasiveness and self-seeking. It means we are willing to forego retaliation. It means we don't insist on strict justice, which can be a blunt instrument, because there is also the element of love and forgiveness. Moderation, gentleness, graciousness, forbearance, very important as we await Christ's return and as we celebrate his first coming. Moderation. Christmas, New Year period. Mm, we can over it, can't we? Perhaps we drink too much. Perhaps we stay out late too much. Moderation, forbearance, graciousness, well, very appropriate. And finally, the word peace. There may not be much peace in a house where there are young children. The children usually get excited. Well, they do in my family anyway. There isn't much peace in the world in which we live in today, is there? But the Christmas message hits right at the heart of our need. For it does, offers us peace. Wherever we are, whoever we are with, whatever our circumstances. The peace which can be ours knowing that Jesus died on that cross, the Prince of Peace died so we can be forgiven. No new life, eternal life. The peace that we're right with God. The peace which is ours when we've done everything possible to be right with those around us. And in the end, we have to hand it over to God. And we can know the peace of knowing we've done what we should do. Others have to respond. And the peace, the peace of knowing that our future is in the hands of God. Wonderful. So four words. Rejoice, thanksgiving, peace, with a touch of moderation as we await the return of Christ and as we celebrate his first coming once again this Christmas. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we have so much to rejoice about, to give thanks for. We thank you for your great love for us, that we can be at peace with you and with those around us. We pray, Lord, that you will Give us that peace which passes all understanding. A peace of knowing that we're right with you. A peace of knowing that we've done what we can in a given situation. And a peace of knowing that whatever happens, the future is safe with you. So bless us as we await your return at the end of the age. Bless us as we celebrate your first coming. And may we be a blessing to others, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.